Welcome to your showcase. Today, austerely minimalist, captivatingly colorful. We sit down with an artist who has a sleek contemporary take on the sacred geometry of Islamic art. Also on the program, we'll be quenching our thirst with some H2O themed artworks in Lisbon, Portugal. But first. The 9,000 lives of Hello Kitty. We'll look at how the queen of all things cute remains a global phenomenon 45 years after she was created. An art collection ahead of its time. We head to Moscow's Pushkin State Museum of Fine Arts to get a taste of the revered Shukin collection. During the early 20th century, French modern art was considered worthless, even among Parisian art circles. But a cloth merchant from Russia boldly sought all the work of these rejected artists. They included big names like Gauguin, Cezanne and Van Gogh. Clearly, Sergei Shukin had a keen sensibility for spotting great art and soon owned one of the most prominent art collections of all time. Shukin's vast collection has never been exhibited under one roof until now. Crowds line up to see some of the best examples of 20th century modern art. Moscow's Pushkin State Museum of Fine Arts is hosting the celebrated collection of Sergei Shukin, one of the greatest art patrons of the early 20th century. His collection is considered to be one of the most prominent collections of European modernist art, encompassing the major artistic trends of his time. Sergei Shukin was born in 1854 into a family of wealthy merchants. He started collecting paintings he enjoyed looking at, which many people considered unpopular at the time. This collection of paintings, brought together entirely according to his personal taste, would end up prefiguring global cataclysms. When the Bolshevik Revolution came, Shukin's collection, described by Stalin as bourgeois and cosmopolitan, was confiscated and later distributed among museums in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Shukin himself had to flee to Paris, where he died in 1936. Since then, the collection has never been gathered as a singular and coherent artistic entity until now. Some of the highlights of the exhibition are the masterpieces of great French Impressionist Claude Monet. After purchasing the Rocks of Belle-Ile, his first Impressionist work, Shukin bought other paintings by Monet over the next six years. He met Claude Monet and he persuaded him to sell him directly two paintings. Uh, one of them is uh, just behind the uh, Japanese bridge of the white water lilies. He almost took it from the brush of Claude Monet. Claude Monet was, was working on this painting uh, when Shukin came. Another artist that shines among others is Paul Gauguin. Shukin purchased a total of 16 canvases from the post-impressionist Tahitian paintings and placed them close to each other to create an impression of a monumental fresco. Well, the paintings were put in a dark room very close to each other and this composition was called Gauguin's Iconostasis, aimed to unite the ritual traditions of humanity. Shokin was also a friend of André Matisse, one of the greatest colorists of the 20th century. When collecting his works, Shukin strived to follow the logic of the fallest artist and chose basic and innovatively simple pieces. Among the 37 Matisse paintings bought by Shukin is also the famous Harmony in Red, or the Red Room. Matisse uh, decided to fill the painting with the uh, primal colors and uh, with the instinct, with the uh, most uh, humane and um, most wild feeling. His great passion for ornament, 
for decorative features of the painting, for textiles, vintage and new, he was definitely a Shukin's or the Shukin's painter. The Moscow collector was one of the few in Russia who valued Pablo Picasso. He ended up owning more than 50 of his works. No other private collection had this many pieces by the Cubist master. Shokin preferred early works by Picasso, which were radical and primitive, and he placed some together in a small room. He first chose a single painting, this very one, a lady with a fan from uh, 1909 to introduce into his uh, Moscow home and he placed it uh, into a corridor which he passed when he went for lunch day by day, week by week and uh, then he found himself uh, in a certain mood, Picasso mood. Shukin, Biography of a Collection, is arguably the most complete version of his collection offering viewers the chance to see it, as Shukin himself conceived it for the first time. Very few cats are as well known around the world as the one right behind me. Japan's ambassador of Kawaii, Hello Kitty, has become a global obsession and spawned a frenzy among collectors. Her image has appeared on everything, from planes to pencil cases, made into diamond-encrusted jewellery, and even spawned Hello Kitty-themed cafes. We'll talk to the curator of an exhibition honouring her Pignus's 45th birthday, although in cat years she's actually 197. But first, showcaser Sena Arslan tells us how this feline became so famous. It all started with this little purse, sold for just under one dollar back in the day in 1974. The year Hello Kitty was born. Her full name is Kitty White. She is described as a little girl with a heart of gold, living in the suburbs of London with her Mama Mary and Papa George. Oh yeah, just a tiny detail. She's not really a cat, apparently, as the design's owner company Sanrio revealed five years ago. But well, let's put her to the duck test. You know how it goes if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck. It's not a little girl. But anyway, we can bypass the ontological status of Hello Kitty for now. It took her a while to grow. Well, not into a grown-up lady cat, but a worldwide icon. This ageless face is 45 years old now and worth billions of dollars. In the last 45 years, the world has done almost anything imaginable with her. We put her face on our airplanes and then flew in them. We dined in kitty-adorned restaurants that look more like shrines of obsession. What is it that drives people so crazy for the kitty? It starts with the design's owner company, Sanrio's business model on promoting social communications. So at face value, marketing the kitty means selling friendship and happiness. And she is, in a way, like a blank canvas, where you can reflect what you feel into her face. At least that's what the number one kitty fan, the man who owns the largest collection of Hello Kitty memorabilia, Masao Gunji, thinks. It's mute, passive, reacts you the way you want it to, which makes her an epitome of postmodernism, or at this point, better called a meow -dernism. And that will be my only cat pun in this video. This simple and clean design is easily reproduced and commercialized. There is no other idea behind it except for this one, really. It's beyond any meta-narratives. To find out more about that narrative and the Hello Kitty 45th anniversary group show, let's cross over to Los Angeles now and bring in Sherry Trahan, the director at Corey Halford Gallery. Hello, Sherry. So, um, what is the appeal of Hello Kitty for us? After all, it's just another cute cartoon character. Why do we have a soft spot for it? Well, Hello Kitty has been 
bringing delight and joy to the world for over 45 years. And her whole message is about universal friendship. And I think that the spreading of happiness and pleasure is something that has made Hello Kitty worldwide and beloved. Hello Kitty also has her own branded album, video games on her name. So can you please talk us through how the pop culture was influenced by Hello Kitty? Well, I, I think a lot of her popularity really started when J-pop came into being and all of the J-pop singers were very much kawaii and Hello Kitty is the queen of kawaii, which is, you know, cuteness only even more. It's even bigger than cuteness. And when the J-pop singers embraced this, it made Hello Kitty even bigger and it kind of went back and forth. They became you know, more cute, more almost Lolita-esque in that um, kawaii fashion. And Hello Kitty rose right up at the same time. And then celebrities embraced her, as we were saying earlier, with, the, you know, the purses, the jewelry, the makeup, the mirrors, everything that exists. Celebrities went crazy about her and they spread through word of mouth. It wasn't even about marketing or advertising. It really spread with word of mouth. And why were you um, intrigued by um, having a Hello Kitty exhibition? What's the appeal there for a curator? We love the idea because of everything that she's about. We like the idea of being able to welcome people into the gallery, into sort of a magical, enchanting world. And by, you know, working with Sanrio and our curator, Caro, who was involved in bringing Sanrio to the table, we were able to create that. And our artists all have their own stories about Hello Kitty's influenced them. She's iconic. And we asked these artists to use their own styles to bring Hello Kitty into their world. We didn't want them to change to become Hello Kitty-ish. We wanted them to do what they do and incorporate Hello Kitty into their world. And then we would present that as the show. Now, apart from happiness and some sort of emotional blank state, Hello Kitty also represents a very wild consumer culture as well. And there was this famous sculpture by Tom Sachs that was criticizing that side of the character. Is there any reference to it in your exhibition, any critical approach? No, we really, we wanted to embrace the joy that Hello Kitty brings everyone the pleasure and laughter and we didn't we didn't want to go down the negative path because there's no need for that we could let tom Sachs have that side of things we really want to embrace hello kitty and the sanrio culture and all the the pleasure and the enthusiasm that that brings i mean people show up at the exhibition wearing hello kitty dresses they have hello kitty socks on hello kitty shoes they're carrying hello kitty backpacks Hello Kitty watches, purses, I mean, everything. People get stylized to come just to see the show and take a lot of photos in front of the pieces. And I mean, that's the whole culture that we wanted to be a part of and that we wanted to spread. Cherry Trahan, the director at Corey Halford Gallery, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. Oh, thank you, it was my pleasure. Still to come on Showcase, Istanbul's newest artist in residence. Visual artist Rana Begum sits down with Showcase to discuss her new residency at the Istanbul Modern and the works she hopes to produce there. Where art meets activism. We'll check in with a group of artists who are raising awareness about water pollution. Water pollution and a lack of clean drinking water are two of the most pressing issues in the world today. So, how to protect and make safe this most precious of liquids? Three young Portuguese artists think they have the answer. Taking trash from the city's rubbish dumps and roadsides and turning them into emotive sculptures. We learn it at school. Water is or at least should be, tasteless, odourless, colourless. 
Colorless, or In Color in Portuguese, is the name of the art exhibition currently on display at the Coimbra Water Museum in Portugal. We challenged artist Bordalo II to create an art show here at Coimbra Water Museum that would raise awareness to this resource that is so valuable but that is getting scarce, water. Addressing consumerism and waste is already Bordalo's trademark. This exhibition brings a message of environmental concern. I invited two other artists who share the same ideals as mine to help me create artworks to address our concerns about the future of the planet, more specifically about water. The two other artists are Miguel Januario and Forrest Dump. We need to move people to help the environment to heal our past mistakes. This is a problem that can only be solved when everybody starts working in collaboration. Three large installations welcome the visitors outside the museum. Visitors are drawn directly to Bordalo's plastic turtle. This is the most photographed artwork here. Bordalo II is a popular name. His animals, made out of trash, are well known not only here in Portugal, but also worldwide. Inside the museum, the first room of the exhibition has videos selected by artist Miguel Januario. There are six videos that evoke the problem of the consumer society and its excess in terms of discarding waste in the environment. It draws attention to our day-to-day -day habits and how much they can damage the planet's ecosystems. Going down the stairs, visitors find a huge shell designed by Bordalo II. The shell invites everyone to go deeper into the matter. Inside the shell, Bordalo assembled a clogged bathroom. In the bathtub, there's no water, only plastic and waste. In the other corner, the tree drawings of forest dump. Branches and brown paint mimicking mud portrait our currently sad reality and what the next decades might look like. According to Forrest Dump, these are the future fossils. Students are developing school projects from this artwork, Future Fossils. They leave the exhibition with a strong lesson about environmental education. I think people nowadays are more aware about the importance of water in terms of using less plastic and changing some habits. But we need to improve much more. After all, there's only hope while we still have water. Centuries-old Islamic art tradition and 20th century Russian constructivism share something crucial in common, the abundance of brightly colored, repetitive, geometric patterns. This next artist takes inspiration from both and creates installations that are as minimal as they are playful. Form, colour and light. These are the three properties that constitute British Bangladeshi artist Rana Begum's holy trinity. In a conversation with showcases Adil Halim, she talks about her childhood memories of Bangladesh, why she cried when she found out about Brexit and the fear of being pigeonholed as a Muslim artist. Welcome to Showcase, Rana. Thank you. What brings you to Istanbul? Well, I'm here on a residency with Istanbul Modern and working on a new series of work. So for people not familiar with your work, you're, you're best known for you know, the bars uh, installation, which at first glance appears minimalist, yeah. but then the colors change as you move. So tell us, you know, walk us through that piece. Um, well, that series of work started um, mainly because I wanted the work um, to somehow embody movement. Um, without really being kinetic. I wanted um, to continue having the viewer's interest and for the viewer to discover something new um, as they, you know, kind of move through the space or, you know, keep walking past it. Um, so the idea was that, you know, as you walk past, you'd see one set of geometry or colour, and then as you start walking past, you'll see another set of colour and geometry appear. 
Um, but what I hadn't anticipated with those works was the kind of the two to interact and create this kind of third layer of geometry and colour. And that's been something that I'm still kind of interested in, um, how colour, light kind of interact with each other. You were born in Bangladesh, but you grew up in the UK. How do you think that shaped your artistry? Um, I think it's affected me quite a lot. I mean, I grew up partly in Bangladesh as a child in the countryside, surrounded by kind of rice fields and water and, you know, and light. And I remember, um, you know, various moments being told off for sitting and staring and being bitten by mosquitoes because I was just amazed by staring, you know, watching kind of the ripple effect in the in the water or the rice fields, you know, this kind of bright green. Um, and even I remember um, landing, you know, uh, at kind of um, Heathrow in London and coming out of the plane and it was a bright sunny day and entirely covered with snow so it was white and again it was very much about light and you know those things I hadn't really connected until kind of much later on um, but it's it's kind of memories that kind of stuck with me. And I read early in your career you were reluctant to talk about your Islamic influences but, but that's changed. How come? It has. Um, I guess you know I'm I feel a lot more confident. I, the reason I, f I was reluctant to kind of bring that up was that, you know, being a female Muslim artist, you know, you have to be careful of being pigeonholed. Um, you know, and I really didn't want that. I didn't even, I don't even like my name being next to my work because I don't, you know, the other reason is that I don't want to dictate to the viewer how they should experience the work and what they should take from the work. You know, I have some idea of how I want the viewer to be, you know, affected by the work or the kind of things that the viewer should experience. But I think it's important, you know, to kind of allow the work, you know, um, to allow the work to be more open and, you know, give the viewer the opportunity to kind of um, experience something, you know, fresh, if you like. Your place uh, of residence is going through Brexit right now. Yeah. How is that, is, has that affected your art? It really has put a kind of a cloud over it, um, you know, Brexit. And it's really saddens me because I was incredibly proud of living and working in London because I feel it's one of the most multicultural city. You know, there's no division. I didn't, I don't feel that division. And in fact, I don't feel it living and working in Hackney. Um, but it is, it's actually, yeah, it's very depressing. I, I mean, I cried, you know, when I heard that, you know, it was happening and, you know, when we got the result because it was such a shock. Um, and I think in some ways it does. It makes me think about how I will be able to continue making my art in London and continue being an artist. Um, and also it's been really tough um, watching other artists struggling um, to survive and um, and industries to survive you know there are people that I work with that you know make my work you know that are struggling to stay you know within you know within London. Uh, what do you hope to learn from your or take away from your residency here at Istanbul Modern? I think um, you know, one of the things that I love uh, about doing residencies is that you really get a chance to um, connect with the place. And it's not just the place, but also the people. Um, I've had such a fantastic, you know, the first trip was just kind of doing research, looking at all the different workshops. But this trip has been really incredible, um, working with the team from from the museum and also connecting, you know, to the workshop. Um, it's been fantastic two days and I've loved today really getting my hands dirty and physically making the work. Uh, I think, you know, when you're an outsider, it's always, you're always kind of perceived differently until you kind of really get involved. And I think for me, you know, I, I love, um, you know, 
the craftsmanship, the kind of the traditional way of working and how things are produced. I'm really interested in um, actually working with material physically. And so being in the workshop the last two days has been amazing. Um, and amazing to watch, you know, the guys in there that, you know, have no concern about health and safety, but, you know, they're really about material. They're really about creating something that's beautiful, that you can really appreciate, you know, the results. Um, and, yeah. And when will we be able to appreciate the final results? Well, next year, hopefully, in the group show, if you get a chance to come back. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. And with that, we wrap up today's show. More of Showcase's coverage of the global arts scene can be found on our YouTube channel. I'm Ilfere Ketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.